Be sure to check out MythVisionPodcast.com. Help MythVision grow, guys. Become a Patreon member. You guys will get early access to all my videos when I'm done editing them. Also, it's a small community where you guys can message me your questions and talk to me in private. You guys can also donate through PayPal and Cash App. Join the social media links down in the description. We have Twitter, Facebook, all sorts of social media. Help the community of MythVision grow. Hit the subscribe button, hit that bell so you guys are notified every time I do a live video and you don't miss any of my content. We are MythVision. Welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. Your host, Derek Lambert. Today is a serious present for you guys. We're recording right after Thanksgiving. This kind of might be an early Christmas present for most of you guys. But on Myth Vision Podcast, we've been exploring tons and tons of information, biblically related, mythology related, and trying to understand the New Testament, Old Testament, and other mythologies. Well, today, you're going to really want to pay attention because it's going to get a little bit complex at times. Dr. Dennis R. McDonald, he's joining us today, and he earned his undergraduate degree from Bob Jones University, a Master of Divinity from McCormick Theological Seminary, and a PhD from Harvard University. He taught Christian origins at the Iliff School of Theology in Denver, Colorado from 1980 to 1998. Since 1998 to present, he has been the John Wesley or was the John Wesley Professor of the New Testament at Claremont School of Theology and Professor of Religion at the Claremont Graduate University. He also was the Director of the Institute for Antiquity and Christianity at Claremont. Seriously, go down in the description. I am asking you guys to really get into this. This is something I'm into, and I started reading the Dionysian Gospel. Have you ever wondered what the Johannine tradition uh, might have used, maybe uh, Euripides the Bacchae as a source? In developing the Johannine Gospel, Dionysus and Jesus having comparison, making Jesus better than Dionysus, this goes deep. This is a very, very good book. Dr. Uh, Robert M. Price said, you guys really need to read this book, and um, I definitely recommend it. Go down in the description. Today, we're going to be touching on this one specifically from the earliest gospel, Q+, to the Gospel of Mark, pretty much the lost gospel. Luke and Virgil, okay, this is going into the imitations of classical Greek literature and the Gospels. I know that for a lot of you, you may not even know what this is. Trust me, look it up. And then I had a few tears drop at the end, at the end of this book. I, I'm not even kidding you. I cracked a few te tears reading Mythologizing Jesus from Jewish teacher to epic hero, Dr. Dennis R. McDonald. And I ask you to go read these things because they're so fascinating, showing Greek poetry as a potential source, what were the gospel authors really trying to do? Write actual history or some type of poetic mythology imitating Greek literature? What is Q? Why does it matter? Your position is called Q plus Papias hypothesis or Pap Papage. What does this mean? So I guess what is Q to start with? And then like, Q and then there's Q plus. Can you give us a little bit of background to this? And then I'm following your lead. And actually, I want to give you a lot of background on this, and um, I'll answer that question and more, I'm sure. But first, Derek, I want to uh, set up the problem of this, the so-called synoptic problem. Actually, there are two problems that still beset the interpretation of the canonical Gospels after two millennia. One is the so-called synoptic problem which is the literary connection among Mark, Matthew, and Luke. The other is the Johannine problem, which is the relationship of the fourth gospel, not only to the Johannine epistles and the apocalypse of John, but also to itself, insofar as it has at least three, three stages of composition that are identifiable. Let's today we're going to talk about the synoptic problem, but uh, maybe in the future we can talk about the um, uh, the Johannine problem or the Dionysian Gospel, if you want. The synoptic problem now is a pitched battle between two competing visions of um, 
synoptic intertextuality. The one argues in both of the primary positions hold to what we call Mark and priority. That is among the three synoptic gospels, Mark is the earliest and was independently used by Matthew and Luke. These uh, combatants today also agree in um, Luke and posterior. That is, that Luke is the last of, or Luke Acts, is the last of the Gospels to have been written. The big controversy has to do with places where, and there are lots of them, Matthew and Luke agree with each other against Mark. And some would say it means that Luke knew Mark and Matthew. Others would say Luke did not know Matthew, and um, therefore they must, they both must have known the same lost source, which is called Q from the German word Kavala, meaning source. And the pitched battle then is between those who deny the existence of Q the far hypothesis and your friend and mine, Mark Goodacre and company, and the two document hypothesis, which is advocated by another friend of mine, uh, John Kloppenborg. And they're very happy to fight it out over whether um, Luke knew Mark, Matthew. Now, both of those positions, however, have problems. And I have the audacity to think that I had solved the synoptic problem and the Johnny problem. And I so much appreciate the opportunity to tell you how that works. When the two document hypothesis people um, go about their task of reconstructing Q, their first task is to eliminate mark and influence because if Matthew and Luke independently used Mark, then the places where they have common information may have come from there, from Mark. Then they, in considering Luke and Matthew separate uh, texts, uh, independent texts, they use something that's been called alternating primitivity. In some cases, Matthew is more primitive. In other cases, Luke is more primitive. And by comparing the two, and it's very scientific and sophisticated, they're able to reconstruct a document that we know is Q. And the most important um, product of the International Q Project is the critical, the so-called critical edition of Q. And that's the Q that most people know or either to affirm or to deny. The, both of those positions, however, have serious problems. And the Q plus Papias hypothesis is an attempt to uh, correct the problems. I'll get to the problems in a moment, but Q plus refers to my reconstruction of Q, which is half again as long as the standard Q, because I use different criteria, which I'll talk about in a moment. Papius is a part of the hypothesis because I take very seriously the Eusebian fragments about Papius, from Papius' exposition of um, Logia about the Lord, um, were written around the year 110. Originally a five volume work, which must have been a treasure trove, which survives in only about 10 pages of recovered text from Testimonia and Fragments. It's a real pity. One of the great losses of early Christian literature is Papius' exposition. The only more serious one seems to be the absence of a lost gospel. Now, the Two document hypothesis has two major flaws. One is there are simply too many examples of Luke's redaction of Matthew 
to to justify understanding them as independent. Luke must have known Matthew. In this case, the far hypothesis people are correct. Furthermore, Luke likely knew Papias' exposition. And if he did, because Papias was so concerned about Matthew, as we'll see, he must have known of the existence of Matthew. And the researcher that he was, he likely knew Matthew too. After all, in his preface, he says, many have undertaken to uh, provide a, an exposition of the things that happened among us. The second problem with the standard two-document hypothesis is we have too many parallels between the reconstruction of Q and Mark to think that they could be possibly independent. This is even after you remove all Mark and influence from Matthew and Luke, ironically. That's why a significant spin-off of the two-document hypothesis is the modified two-document hypothesis which affirms Q, but insists that Mark knew it as well. You could say that my hypothesis is more similar to that than any of the going hypotheses um, today. But the far hypothesis has severe problems too. First, as we'll see, there is lots of evidence that there was a lost gospel. But even more so, even if Luke knows Matthew, Luke knows traditions and um, logia that are more primitive than what we find in Matthew. This is a, a something that's called reversed priority. And my work requires reversed priority as its primary criterion for assessing the Gospels. So, whereas um, the the uh, two-document hypothesis talks about alternating primitivity. I talk about reversed primitivity or, yeah, or priority. That is, we know that the Gospels are written as Mark, Matthew, Luke. All of the major disputants agree with that. But sometimes Luke is earlier than Matthew or Mark. And sometimes Matthew is earlier than Mark. That's why there's been so much confusion in the synoptic problem, because you have this phenomenon, the reverse priority. Now then the question is, how does one determine what is prior when you have two comparative texts? And so I list out a number of criteria that uh, one can use for reverse priority that common sense is the most important criterion of all. When you look at two texts, often you can tell which one is earlier than another. Now, the biggest contribution that the Synoptic Gospels make to the Lost Gospel are um, doublets and non-doublets. I'm going to discuss those, but then I'm going to go back and talk about Papias. I was going to say, just to give a recap, uh, we, we interviewed Dr. Goodacre, and Dr. Goodacre is in the fair hypothesis view. He doesn't think there's Q, of course, and I don't want to get caught up on that because we want to talk about how, what this hypothesis is and how it answers the synoptic problem and whatnot. I just want to mention for our audience that was really entertained by the the interview that we did with Dr. Goodacre, there will be a debate between you and him on this channel. So you guys do want to stay tuned and pay attention to what Dr. McDonald is saying here because Papias, I'm going to suspect, and we're going to hold this question for later unless you address it in thorough, like thoroughly address it to the best you can without <laughs> – without uh, everyone wanting to go to sleep because it can get very deep. When I was reading this, it's very complex and, and very interesting. Um, Papias plays a huge role in this hypothesis. So everyone who pays attention, um, I really want you to get what he's saying. He's saying in simple terms like me, I have to hear things more than once to really get them, um, that Luke, which is way later than Mark, all right, and we know Matthew's later than Mark, has stuff that is older than Mark in it. And 
you have to ask yourself why, you know, well, why is where, where are they getting the older material from? Did they just make it up? Did they pretend, you know what, let's make this sound older. That seems like Occam's razor doesn't really fit that argument. In my opinion, what's stronger is there's a source of some sort that they're pulling from. And so Dr. McDonald goes into a lot and while reading your book, it's very deep, especially the, the uh, master uh, synopsis here that I'm reading. It's like, goes from English and then Greek. And I'm like, okay, I got to Google what that Greek word is. So you're dealing with somebody who is a serious PhD in this area and do not take him lightly. So I'm interested in hearing, I'm sorry to cut you off, doublets and non-doublets and the progressive of that thought. I want to know what a doublet is. I don't even know what, you know, if you were to break it down for me, I'd love to know in our audience as we go, because some of these terms will be understood by some and some of them may not be understood like me. I'm ignorant on a lot of this stuff and uh, I would just like to learn more. So I'll be quiet. <laughs> well, let's back up uh, a little bit and talk about Papias. Papias is writing around the year 110 and he is by far the earliest and most important witness to synoptic gospels. But he's writing before the composition of Luke and John. So he does not know those Gospels. There's almost, that's almost certain. But he does know three Gospels. He knows a Gospel that likely is similar to our Gospel of Mark. And he knows two Gospels of Matthew. One of them likely is our Gospel of Matthew, more or less. But the other is lost. I want to read to you what he says about Mark, just a, a brief piece, and then what he says about Matthew, and give you my interpretation of them. And you're exactly right. It is at the core of my understanding. And by the way, I'm going to advertise another book. Um, Two Shipwrecked Gospels um, is the fat uh, version of my argument. Um, and it, it's where I go into even more detail in a granular assessment of the synoptics and it has its own Greek synopsis uh, embedded in it. But also I want to advertise another book. I'm, I'm working on, and, and nearly done now, with, a, with two mimetic synopses. The one is of four synoptic gospels, which includes my reconstruction of Q, which I call the Logoi of Jesus, which likely was its original title, and three gospels of John. That is, I compare in parallel columns the three versions of the gospel of John, going from the Dionysian gospel to what I call the Jewish gospel, then to the gospel of the beloved disciple. And um, but that's uh, another story. But here's what Papias says about Mark. Mark became Peter's translator. Whatever Peter recalled of what was said or done by the Lord, Mark wrote down accurately, though not in proper taxis, that is not in proper sequence. For Mark himself neither heard the Lord nor followed him, but as I said, he later followed Peter who used to craft teachings for the needs of the occasion, not as though he were crafting a sequential arrangement of the logia about the Lord, that is, um, the units of what Jesus said or did. So Mark was not in error by thus writing a few things as he remembered them. Now Mark's, this is my word, Mark's order or tox of logia or toxis accordingly need not be authoritative for Papias insofar as he merely translated into Greek a few things as he remembered from Peter, what Peter had remembered and taught without regard for a proper sequence. Obviously, John had compared Mark's few things with a larger work or works that presented the logia in a different order. Papias also attributed the following statement to the elder John, and this is crucial. Matthew set in order the logia in the Hebrew language, but each, Hekestos, translated them as he was able, which indicates that they were flawed Greek translations. 
The expression, as he was able, suggests that each translator mishandled Matthew's Hebrew original and accurate sequence. A Semitic version of Matthew likely never existed, but if even if it did, Papias, by his own admission, had no access to it, nor did the disciple John. John and Papias thus had a synoptic problem. Their three Greek Gospels contain similar logia, but in incompatible sequences. Insofar as the toxis of, or the order, of parallel logia in Mark and canonical Matthew are basically identical, the deviating sequence likely appeared in the Gospel of Matthew, the lost Gospel of Matthew. So when Papias then goes on, he says, I want to put things back into their correct order. And so he is, his project is to give preference to the two Gospels of Matthew he knows. One that we know and one that we don't know, but has the content in a different order that Papias wants to reassemble. Now, it's not accidental that Q and Papias both failed to survive, even though they both are hugely valuable for understanding the historical Jews. It's, and Papias didn't survive because Logoi, or the Q document, didn't survive. And we'll talk about that perhaps, um, why it didn't survive some other time. But Matthew gives evidence that he has a synoptic problem, too. He knows Mark. Almost all scholars say he knows Mark. But he must know something else because of what we call doublets. A doublet is the repeating of a logion, or a saying, or a story, in Matthew where one of the examples comes from Mark. So we have a control on it. He's, he's, he's editing Mark. But he's got another one that comes from somewhere else, or at least is different. And in every case, it's more primitive than the one we've got in Mark. So this is reverse priority. It means that Matthew occasionally is more primitive than Mark because he's using a source that is earlier than Mark. Now, it's not that we only have two or three examples of them. In, um, we have 18 doublets in Matthew, and in each case, the non marked doublet, the non marked version, is more primitive than what we find in Mark. You had your finger up. Yeah, yeah. I, I just want to clarify um, the doublet you're talking about. Are these sayings? These are logiae of Jesus. These are now, these are sayings that aren't in the Markan Gospels, or some of them are probably sayings of Jesus that we don't find in Mark, but we know he knows Mark. He's using Mark. There's a doublet there, but there are some that aren't sayings that no. are more primitive. Okay. Thank you for the clarification, because I'm sure others are going to have the same thing. In all 18 of these doublets, you do have a parallel in Mark. He's using Mark and, and editing it for his own purposes. But he duplicates that content elsewhere, you know, always in a different sequence. And in every case, it's earlier than what you have in Mark. Once one has these criteria in place, but most of the time, it's actually intuitive. You can see that it's early um, just by comparing. Them. Now, most scholars would say that just means that Matthew knows an oral tradition that's more primitive than Mark, and he retains the oral tradition, which actually is possible. But I want to, I'll get to an argument that makes it more literal. But in addition to doublets, is what scholars unfortunately call non-doublets. And a non-doublet I need to explain because it also is important. Um, there We don't have as many non-doublets as we have doublets. We only have six in Matthew. We have seven in Luke. And, but a non-doublet is this. When you read a gospel parallel and you have the two texts in common, or the three texts in common, you the synopsis. 
frequently you will see that Mark has been editing, uh, Matthew has been editing Mark. And all of a sudden he stops. But he stops because he's used the same material elsewhere. So he's, it's not a doublet because he's not any more editing Mark, but he's got an, an alternative somewhere else in the gospel. And in every case, again, that's more primitive than what we find in Mark. Now, how can that be? So now we have in the combination of doublets and non-doublets, a total of 24 logia or sayings that are more primitive in Matthew than they are in Mark. This is reverse priority. But you have the same phenomenon in Luke. Luke has, uh, by my count, 14 doublets and seven non-doublets. And in every case, when you have the non-Mark and doublet, it is more primitive and it's in a different sequence. So we know, so here's the argument for a missing gospel thus far. Matthew, uh, Papias knows two Matthews. We know only one. And he also knows Mark, but he doesn't know Luke. He thinks that the, both of the Matthews he knows were translations of a Hebrew original. And both are flawed. And he wants to put everything back into Matthew's order by doing a, his own synopsis. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to, to rearrange things. Now, Matthew, writing earlier than Papias, obviously, knows Mark. But he knows something else that's more primitive than Mark because of these doublets and non-doublets. In other words, Non-Mark and doublets are earlier than the equivalent to Mark. Then what's amazing is that Luke, writing around 115, 120, uh, yeah, 120 perhaps, that is much later, is more primitive in his doublets and non-doublets to both Matthew and Mark. That's astonishing. Now, it even gets more wild than that. We know in places where there are doublets or non-doublets that Luke is more primitive than Matthew. So that even, and by the way, this is going to be probably the core of our discussion with, um, Bart, with um, Mark Goodacre. I agree with the far hypothesis that Luke knows Matthew. I agree with you, Mark, that uh, Luke knows Matthew. But that can't explain why Luke is so frequently more primitive than Matthew. Now, Luke, uh, um, Mark Goodacre is very uh, familiar with that problem. And he and other advocates of the far hypothesis have worked hard to say that these apparent instances of Luke being more primitive than Matthew can be accounted to by oral tradition or alternative sources or whatever without appealing to you. But you cannot say, and, and this is really important, you cannot say that whatever Luke has as a parallel to Matthew is derivative from that. It's coming from somewhere else. Now, in my view, and this is not so important for our discussion right now, Mark knows Q as well. Now, so far, so I'm going to let you ask a question of that because I'm going to shift attention from source redaction criticism, that is from this microscopic literary assessment into a sociological assessment. Okay, yeah. So uh, that was one of my questions that you brought up, even though it's not as important. Did Mark know Q? And it sounds like they did, but that makes me ask, you know, questions in my mind that aren't really important during this discussion. But one of the questions, you, since we brought up Papias, Papias has two Gospels. He he believes there's two Matthews here that are that are uh, 
uh, if you will, mistranslated into Greek and there's problems. And there's also Mark that's not in the right order. So technically he's setting to try and correct the problem, which means where's inerrancy, my good Christian friends, you know, where's your infallibility here, right here. You have church fathers who are already saying we got a problem, but here's the question I have because a lot of skeptics who are watching, uh, especially their Eusebian skeptics, they definitely don't trust Eusebius. They say Eusebius is writing uh, 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 propaganda. He's not really writing um, uh, a fair account. And it seems that the, you can correct me here because I'm not educated in this area, is that we have to trust Eusebius to trust his account about Papias because we have no existing works of Papias. Um, and that Eusebius is writing his exposition of Papias. So now you got to trust that what Eusebius is saying about Papias is accurate. Um, can we trust it? And it sounds like there is enough here to trust. And one reason I want to say, is it a good argument to say, why would they be saying these things about these gospels that aren't positive? It's not a good thing. He's saying, you know, we got problems with our gospels, but I'm going to try and fix them. That could be an argument of embarrassment, so to speak, to say this is kind of a trustworthy source to, to rely on. If it was all glory and good and positive and miraculous, then you might say, yeah, nice try. It sounds too legendary. This doesn't sound very legendary. So is that a good argument to say this is trustworthy? Or how would you go about to prove to somebody that is very skeptical of Eusebius? And rightly so. I mean, I take him tongue in cheek and oh, let, me t- let me be careful with this guy. What do you say? Is he trustworthy? Ah. I think Eusebius is not trustworthy. So, um, but let me make an argument about how one can read between the lines of Eusebius. Eusebius's investment is that at an early time, you have these gospels and early readers trusted their reliability. So Mark wasn't in error in writing things um, as he remembered them. So they're not in the right order, but, you know, give him a break. He's simply recording what he heard. Now, Matthew wrote his stuff, and it was authoritative in the right order. But these two stupid Greek translators botched it up. Now, that's not, you're right, your argument is actually very interesting. He If Papias wanted to go full throttle in getting rid of Papias, he could have omitted that stuff, that the Greek translations are are botched. So you can read between the lines. By the way, I don't trust Papias' interpretation either, so that the scholar has to sift the evidence and not accept the evidence. But that it is evidence is important. And we, since we have nothing else, I'm going to to think that it, that it's that we can run with it. If nothing else, Eusebius opens himself up to the possibility that there's a lost gospel because of the two Matthews. Now, later on, it's clear that uh, Eusebius has almost total contempt for Papius. He says he's a man of very little intelligence. You can figure that out by reading it for yourself. And that means that Papias' text was still publicly available in the fourth century. So um, it was still around. And apparently in Armenian circles, it was available to the 13th century, perhaps longer. So it was around, but it was an embarrassment. And I think it was an embarrassment because Papias' project didn't make any sense if you, once you don't have the lost gospel. Now, what I've said thus far is primarily source redaction criticism. It's the kind of engagement that I would have with Mark Goodacre or Mark Berman or or, uh, um, John uh, Kloppenborg and so on. What is missing, though, in the discussion, which I'm trying to solve in another book, this this two uh, mimetic synopses that I'll talk about, are two additional methodologies. One I would call social identity criticism, 
That is, it uses sociological categories for category cat, for categorizing texts. And the other is mimesis criticism, about which we'll talk about more and be introduced with the introduction of my books. Social identity criticism evaluates in-group, out-group behaviors and stereotypes when there's an asymmetrical balance in power, wealth, and status. So when we look at this cluster of material that we gather with these non-market doublets and non-doublets and reverse priority, no matter it doesn't matter what the order they're in at this point. What we can see is that they have a distinctive social identity that is different from the synoptics. In other words, this material coheres. Now, you could say at this point that it coheres because of Jesus himself and the memory of Jesus had a certain kind of stability. It probably did. But it's more likely, as we'll see, that it comes from a literary stratum earlier than the end of the Gospels. In other words, the lost gospel. So, for example, it, oh, and by the way, social identity criticism is also interested in the prototypical leader. So Jesus clearly is the prototypical leader. Now, in the Q, in these materials that are reverse priority materials, Jesus is the son of God at his baptism. And he's offered bread, protection from angel, by angels and all the kingdoms of the world. But when he goes out to call disciples, he says, the son of man has no place to lay his head. Welcome to homelessness. So as the son of God, he's been offered all the kingdoms of the world. He prefers rather to identify with humankind. This is the first reference anywhere, anywhere, that Jesus is the Son of Man. Paul doesn't know about it. It doesn't appear in, um, in other places. It appears first. In and when Jesus goes out, he says, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He's working with the socially marginal. He's working with the blind and the lame, the dead, the poor. My reconstruction of Q includes his forgiveness of the sinful woman, who in fact was a sinner. She never repents. Um, and so Jesus's attitude toward um, in his identity is he's the son of God, but he's, he's the son of man who is there for the socially marginal. He's there for the poor. Now, what does that mean about the outgroup? The primary outgroup are those who are oppressing the poor, namely the Pharisees and what are called the um, nomaniki, the, the uh, lawyers, the experts on the nomos, on the law. And uh, uh, let me read to you uh, a passage about what the author has to say about these people. Woe to you exegetes of the law, for you bind burdens and load on the backs of people, but you do not want to lift your finger to move, using the law to oppress. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the front seat in the synagogues and accolades in the market. Woe to you, exegetes of the law, for you shut the kingdom of God from people. You do not go in, nor let those going, uh, trying to get in, get in. The kingdom of God is the cipher that the author uses for Jesus' followers. They're in the kingdom of God. Um, woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint, dill, and cumin, and give up justice and love. It goes on and on. And you can see that the author is reshaping the identity of his group, having Jesus as the prototypical leader, vilifying the outcome. So much of Q is in con is the controversies, 
controversies over gleaning on the Sabbath, healing on the Sabbath, washing hands before eating, the Beelzebul controversy. Jesus can cast out demons, but he does it by Beelzebul. Um, so uh, the this is a conflict document. Now, I'm going to read the Beatitudes to you that appear in Luke. They don't appear this way in, in the Matthew. So this gives a sense of this um, out-group, in-group um, uh, understanding. The in-group is the kingdom of God crowd, where Jesus is followers, and they are identified with the outsider. And those, uh, I, I don't want it to be so applied to the um, unfortunate bifurcation we have in American politics right now. But I think you'll see how it's applicable. So here are the blessed, here, these are the Beatitudes. This is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, or in Q, the inaugural sermon. Blessed are you poor, for the kingdom of God is for you. This is stereotyped in group um, definition, right? The poor. The kingdom of God is for you. Blessed are you who hunger, for you will eat your fill. Blessed are you who mourn, for you will be consoled. Blessed are you when they hate and insult you. This is in-group, out-group tension and hostility, right? And say every kind of evil against you because of the Son of Man, who identifies with the poor and the hungry. Be glad and exult, for vast is your reward in heaven, for this is how they treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for their fathers treated the false prophets in the same manner. Salt is good. But if salt becomes insipid, with what will it be seasoned? Neither for the earth nor for the dunghill is it fit. They throw it out. God will throw out the rich and the privileged and those who abuse the prophets, namely the religious leaders. Um, in faith, and so that Jesus identifies with the poor and has this radical social movement um, message. And it's the kind of thing that can get people killed crucified so social identity and by the way this social identity of Jesus as the son of God but the son of man who's with the poor and the vilification of the Pharisees and the religious leaders and the prizing of the poor and the hungry does appear in later Gospels, but not with the same intensity. And they are no longer a minority group. This is certainly clear in the facts. They're not a minority group. They're a major movement. And by using social identity criticism, one can see that Mark has a certain kind of social identity he's dealing with. Matthew has his own. Luke has his own. And they're all different from this collection of material that underlies the Gospels. Now, one could say that it reflects Jesus and the Jesus movement as a, 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 a religious movement hostile to the Jewish authorities. But as we're seeing now with Nemesis criticism, it comes out of a document. Now, you had asked um, in your notes that before we talk, what does this mean about the historical Jesus? And so before getting into nemesis criticism and this final thing, I want to talk with you about that. The ethos and the social definition that the author has in the lost gospel is the closest evidence we have to Jesus's own self-understanding. Now, it's not identical. 
as we'll see, because there's also a, a, a literary project that's at work. In other words, already the process of mythologizing has begun, although all in Jewish categories, not in Greek categories. But this is one reason I am so, sorry for the word, evangelical about this lost evangelium, about this lost gospel, because I think its historical worth is huge. And you can see some of this already in um, the Pauline epistles, this concern about the kingdom of God, who's, uh, who's in, and the concern for opening up the community to Gentiles, and uh, criticism of legal authority and law. So um, I feel very strongly about this social identity criticism. And you won't find that in the discussion of the synoptic problem. And it's a pity, it's a tragedy that, 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 it, it, that we've only talked about the literary features and, you know, whether Luke knows Matthew or whatever. But there's something to be said for social identity in this material that is what I find very compelling. Okay, so Dr. Dr. McDonald, if you don't mind me uh, poking a few things here, <clears throat> this is interesting, the social identity criticism, because it does touch the Gentile uh, discussion. And I think it's important to ask you, maybe if you can uh, here, and this isn't in our list of uh, notes, I didn't really think to ask this. But um, because you brought up social identity, I think it's an important to kind of understand not only is he dealing with the poor that appears like he has a poor movement, uh, almost stoic Judaism, you know, where it's focused on the poor Jews, if you will. And Matthew seems to be focused on this phrase, if you will, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And this phrase is like very unique that he even kind of defines like, don't go in the way of the Gentiles, stay away from the Samaritans. Yeah. There's a Samaritan rivalry taking place between Jews and Samaritans in the first century. At least Josephus documents, there's even a Jewish Samaritan war that happens around that time. So Matthew seems to be more Jewish, obviously, but can you maybe briefly elaborate on the contention here and why Matthew seems to go all the way out of his way to make this like uh, Matthew 1 21, uh, Jesus, uh, you shall call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. Like he makes this Jesus seem to be very much focused primarily almost exclusively on Jews or Israelites. And the other gospels don't have those exclusionary tendencies as much. In fact, they go out of the way to say, you know, uh, they try to break beyond that, it seems. Uh, wh what's going on with the if the social tension here, and we use this social criticism here, uh, this ties into that, does it not? Oh, sure it does. Um, I want to say, though, that I think the issue isn't that Q is more stoic. I think it's more cynic. And, and there's a big difference between the two. Stoics are socially conservatives. They would like Pharisees in law, in law and order. Um, cynics um, like the, the freestyle and identification with the poor and so on. So it's more cynic than stoic. But Matthew already is making the, um, the gospel more widespread to Gentiles than Q did. Now, Q already has Jesus saying he's found more faith in a Roman centurion than anyone in Israel, right? He also says that many will come from east and west and eat with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you law-abiding folks are going to find yourselves cast out. In my reconstruction, it also has the Matthean statement, prostitutes and tax collectors will be in the kingdom of God before you guys will. Now, what Matthew does, though, is because of the Canaanite woman, who is a Canaanite, um, Jesus uh, exercises her daughter because it's his, his mission is no longer exclusively to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as it was in the Q document. Um, 
it's the Jewish authorities at Jesus's birth who want to kill him, namely Herod and others. But it's the Magi from the East who come and bring their gifts. At the end of the gospel, whereas in the Q document, Jesus says, do not go to the Gentiles or the Samaritans, Jesus, the risen Jesus appears and says, go into all the ethne, all into all the Gentiles, and preach the gospel and, and baptize. So that even though they're in, so social identity for Matthew is a little more complex, um, but it's more open. And what I would say, the membranes between the in-group and the out-group are more porous for Matthew than they are for the Q document. And already he's trying to open the gospel up. Now, Mark already did it before Matthew, and Luke does it in spades. But the big issue for me, methodologically, is you're exactly right. Once you see these social identity markers of the leader, the in group, the out group, competition, hostility, um, upward and, and downward mobility, and so on, I mean, it's, it becomes very complex. You can apply it to literary texts and see that these are different moments. The same thing's true in the Gospel of John. You can identify the three strata of the Gospel of John by their different social identities. Now, uh, I wanted to kind of wrap up what I was hoping that we could say with one other observation. This is Mimesis criticism. Mimesis criticism is simply the, anal the analysis of a text over against an antecedent text that it uses as a literary model. It doesn't use it as a source. It's not trying to incorporate the material, but it's trying to rewrite it. And in the case of the Logo of Jesus, it's a rewriting of Deuteronomy from beginning to end. So in Two Shipwreck Gospels, I give criteria for reconstructing the context of the literary flow of the book. And from beginning to end, it imitates Deuteronomy. In fact, I'll, I'll give you just a few examples. The name of Deuteronomy in Hebrew is Hadabrim, that is, the words. In the Septuagint, it begins, these are the law that Moses spoke in the wilderness as a rebuke to Israel. How does the Logoi of Jesus begin? The Logoi of Jesus, not Moses. John the Baptist is in the wilderness preaching the gospel to um, the, the brood of vipers. In Jesus' um, three temptations, in each case, he quotes from Deuteronomy. In the inaugural sermon, he takes 12 disciples up a mountain to give them a new Torah. At the end of it, he says, if you do these things, you're like a man who built his house on a rock. If you don't do them, you're like someone who built his house on sand. The end of Deuteronomy is all about blessings and curses for what you do with the law. At the end of, the, of Logoi, Jesus says to his 12 followers, uh, when I sit in the kingdom, when the Son of Man sits on the throne in the kingdom that God will give, you will each have a throne. There will be 12 thrones, and you'll sit judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, there are other um, indications of this hostility or this rewriting of Deuteronomy in the law boy of Jesus, which is its model. It is modeling itself after Deuteronomy to portray Jesus as the new prophet of Moses, but in a different way. In the inaugural sermon, Jesus says, the law and the prophets were until John the Baptist. After that, the kingdom of God is in force. Right? So the law prophets are in the old. So you have in the law of Jesus, the new Deuteronomy. With Jesus as the prophet like Moses. Now, what how what's the status of the law for this kingdom of God community? Those who observe all the, the commandments are going to be called great in the kingdom. 
but even those who do not obey all the law will be in the kingdom of God. They'll just be called the least. So when Jesus has a, a debate with the, the, the legal authority about what is the great commandment, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. If you do this, you will live. That is the only commandment that's required of the law in order to be a member of the kingdom of God. That is so radical in terms of first century Judaism. Um, and whether Jesus himself would have signed on to that, I don't know. I suspect he might have. But I know that, that that's what's going on with the socio... It's my view that that's what's going on with the social identity of the author, which is different from the the social identity markers that you have in independent contributions by the other evangelists. So let me ask you a couple questions, if you don't mind, when we, since we're getting near to the hour. And, and here's the interesting thing. There's so much more you wrote that <clears throat> we're not really touching on. You give great examples. There's, a, there's many examples. You go into the literary structure. I mean, you have charts and diagrams and all that good stuff. And you get into the Greek. You get into the source here. To put it in layman's terms, in the basic chronology of who the the development of Jesus, if you were to say the bare bones historical guy, um, to ask a, a social uh, question here, do you think he gave a hoot about Gentiles? I do you think he had a mission that really was to talk to Gentiles to incorporate Gentiles, or do you think he was exclusively Jewish only, and that the writers developed this and? Uh, there were real restrictions on this community and it ends up growing and developing, becoming broader and broader as followers uh, change the movement. What, what do you think? What do you think the earliest Jesus, um, you know, you give the hint that if he is cynic, but he's very about the poor and he's kind of bucking up against the leadership. Well, we got a problem with this guy. We need to take this guy out. And I've heard many people think he was a rebel, which is why the Romans would have crucified him to begin with. He must have been like leading a movement, a revolt against the leadership of Rome, but not only not maybe not so much then, maybe just the Jews. I don't know, but he was definitely a rebel, according to some. Who was Jesus? And was he OK with Gentiles? Is that something completely foreign to the movement? It seems like Acts chapter 10 is trying to make Peter convinced that this is God. Like he didn't know, hold on, this wasn't part of the program. How come these guys are in this uh, this now? I, I don't know. What are your thoughts? Um, I'm going to play the role of a historian and just say, what are what's the evidence? And the best evidence we have for the historical Jesus being open to Gentiles comes from Paul. Paul has a mission that includes Gentiles and creates hostility with um, Jewish authorities and with uh, Judaizers and so on. And he understands the kingdom of God to be inclusive. Now, that's even before Q. Paul didn't, couldn't have known Q. And so the Q document, written be shortly before the war, is giving an all uh, a similar alternative to that um, to traditional Judaism. We also have a contested passage in Josephus, in which uh, James the Just is killed by Torah observant Jews, but other Jews come to his rescue. Now, whether James the Just was had a Gentile mission or not, I doubt. But it means that his attitude toward Torah was marginal. Yes, he was Torah observant enough so Torah observant people would defend him, but he must have violated Torah. And after all, he's called the, the just, right? Um, but he must have violated Torah enough to get himself in trouble. So he represents, I think, a marginal group in Judaism that is critical of its own law. 
Now, whether that includes an openness to Gentiles, I don't know. But I think what one can say, whatever Jesus' own position was, his understanding of the kingdom of God is a moral and not a genetic issue, not a, um, or an ethnic issue, um, makes itself felt in uh, both the Q document and in Paul. And I would say that that's pretty interesting confluence of information and social identity. I absolutely agree with you. And uh, we definitely could deal a lot more in detail and go into all these things. But I think that for now, they need to get the book. <laughs> it's a big one. But, I, you know, you got me interested. I feel like I need to get the two shipwreck gospels to really dig into some of this and look at it for myself. I have a lot more questions um, that uh, we can even develop over time, maybe, and have yeah. additional questions from our guest. Uh, or from uh, from our um, audience, they can ask questions and maybe we can get that because really what I think we need to do is develop uh, questions and have you debate uh, Dr. Goodacre and then have a post debate show uh, for both of you guys where you guys can maybe comment on the previous debate on what you thought uh, pros and cons things issues you take with uh, each other's arguments and also maybe we can um, deal with some of the questions that people have developed from this show and potentially the debate itself so they can see oh well okay I see what they did with that he answered my question and go from there but I can tell you it's complicated this is a very complex system um, the far hypothesis does not uh, take into Papias it, or any of these, the two document hypothesis, the fair hypothesis, far, fair. Um, are they even talking Papias or is this something well, exclusively they, you? They obviously know about Papias, and, but they dismiss the arguments. And we can talk about that another time. Okay. If, if you don't mind, Derek, I'd like to make the hypothesis really simple with the summary. Okay. The Q plus Papias hypothesis really is very simple in its basic commitments and very complex in its development. But it's very simple this way. Matthew has two sources informing. One is Mark. And another has similar content, but in a more primitive version. Papias comes along and he knows Matthew and Mark, but he also knows another Matthew that has things in a sec separate order. Luke comes along and he's the last of the synoptic authors, and he has the same phenomenon of doublets and non doublets. He knows Papias, apparently, so he knows Matthew. But much of his content is more primitive than anything else that we have. It's likely that it comes from a lost gospel. By using social identity criticism, you see that these materials that can be identified with these non marking doublets and non-doublets has a distinctive social identity, both for Jesus, for the members of the kingdom of God, and for the Torah observant of But when you assemble these texts into these units, into a book, it seems to be a mimetic imitation of Deuteronomy to portray Jesus as the prophet like Moses. And so those three methodologies, not just source redaction criticism, which is where we get stuck in the synoptic problem, but also social identity issues and literary mimetic issues, I think, close the door on there must have been a lost gospel. I would never say that I have precisely reconstructed it. There's no way of knowing how close that would be. But that we have a lost gospel that can be reconstructed with this criterion of reverse priority, I consider to be uh, firm. 
I like that. That's very interesting. So, ladies and gentlemen, the Q plus papius hope hypothesis that Dr. Dennis McDonald will suggest the Q is the mimetic of De of Deuteronomy. Okay, so Q is the mimetic of De Deuteronomy. Mark and Luke, of course, are the mimetic uh, critic connection, if you will, is to the Homeric epics in the Iliad. The Johannine, uh, here you have the Johannine, which is the Euripides, the Bacchae, and Dionysus. I love this stuff. This, I love this material. I, I don't know why. I, I guess finding out that these books aren't, they're not the magic I, I was told that when I was Christian. And when I was a hardcore Christian fundamentalist, you know, there's like this um, protection when you're in the bubble of defending the Bible to be this magical, inerrant, infallible, God-breathed, perfect, jot and tittle book. And this right here, like, tears down all the apologetics. I mean, it, you know, any inerrancy, infallibility type argument from Christ Christians, this, it, it brings beauty in a different way. It, it, it yes. but it tears it down the whole structure that they build. So, you know, people have criticized my work by saying that I'm so anti Christian. And uh, I am an atheist. But I love these texts. And it pains me that the people who claim to love them most misunderstand them so badly. And I think once one can, it, I would say that it's like having a prism where sunlight going through a prism gets refracted into various strands. That what we can see is the various strands show a richness of moral development, social sophistication, philosophical sophistication that is invisible if you only see the single beam of light going into the prison. And what happens with uh, too, too often with Christian piety is we find this one beam going but never gets to the prison. And the prism makes the light more beautiful than the light would have been otherwise. And I love these texts and I find myself nourished by them. But um, it, it's such a pity that the people who claim to love these texts the most and to love Jesus the most uh, have so much trouble understanding the, the glorious diversity of these texts. Well said. <laughs> really well said ladies and gentlemen get the books i mean uh he's got a lot more and there's a man named truth surge who's been on youtube for a while he has a series he called excavating the empty tomb he used the homeric uh, connections to argue that uh you know there was no actual empty tomb um using a lot of this critical scholarship that you have developed uh i hope you know there's a lot of your work out there that's being used by people that you probably don't agree with even uh but i know one of the guys that i'm interested in interviewing for the show is brian matarescu i think i'm pronouncing that right it's mirarescu technically matarescu and he wrote a book called The Immortality Key, and he's uh, discussing this uh, idea that uh, early Christians in their sacraments were taking a psychedelic type of wine punch, if you will. They kind of spiked the, the wine a little. But somewhere along the lines, he uses your work. I'm not sure where and how, but um, I would love been, to. We've huh? been in communication. We've been in communication. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'd, has he contacted you? Yes. Okay. I hope to get him on the show someday. Maybe I can have you and him join on the show. I don't know. I'd love to do that, but uh, Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. it would, it would. So do you have any closing words you'd like to make to the audience? One thing we didn't talk about is why the Q plus papius hypothesis does not have legs in the discussion. Yeah. You if know, you don't mind, can you comment on that before we go? Um, First of all, I'm surprised by it and frustrated by it. And for that reason, I'm so great, grateful for this opportunity to share this material. But I think there are two other factors. 
One is, uh, unfortunately, scholarly jealousy. That if I'm right, people on both of these um, sophisticated positions, the far hypothesis and the two document hypothesis, are wrong. And nobody wants to give publicity to people they differ with. So that is one piece. But also, I must say, you've talked about this several times. There's a reason why the synoptic problem has not been handled for 2,000 years properly. And the reason is that the solutions are complex. And two, uh, two shipwreck gospels is not easy reading. It's heavy sledding and it was heavy writing. But we have been doing something wrong if we still have to debate as rigorously as we do how these gospels relate to each other. We've been doing something wrong. And for better or worse, the Q plus Papias hypothesis permits an alternative way of getting beyond the impasse. Yes, I agree with the far hypothesis, Luke knows Matthew. Yes, I agree with the two document hypothesis that there's a missing gospel, and mine is actually larger because of this issue of reverse priority. So the complexity of the argument um, contributes to its lack of popularity, I would put it that way. So I'm doing my best to make it accessible. And by the way, the synoptic problem is not going to be answered just by identifying Q. Just as important is a topic that we're going to pursue probably in uh, other YouTube uh, videos is the imitation of Greek poetry as a way of establishing social identity for the Gospels, especially in Mark and Luke. So um, the solution to the synoptic problem is complex. My solution is one of the more complex solutions to it. And it doesn't, it doesn't lend itself easily to an elevator speech. I agree. <laughs> this is this has been such a good time. Um, you're right. It's a very complex issue. I'm glad that we tackled this one first because then we're going to do a, a number of videos, hoping six. But who knows? God rested on the seventh day. Worst comes to worst. We get a seventh one in. We have a debate coming up with you and Dr. Carrier on the historical Jesus, whether or not it was a historical man who was mythologized, or was this a divine celestial figure who was euhemerized at some point later in time? And uh, that's going to be an interesting debate. We'll, we're going to be recording that December 17th. And also, um, sometime in the second week of January, this is new news to you, Dr. McDonald. I'm just now remembering I've got a I was going to email you. Um, Dr. Goodacre said that uh, any time the second week of January, we can record a debate with you and him. And I think this is going to be two wonderful videos to, to hear both sides and how you guys develop your arguments. But um, I'm trying to get my head wrapped around the complexity here because this is such an interesting thing. One of the good questions I have, and maybe you do too, you might go, yeah, that's a good question down in the comment section if you've made it this far into the video, is why are there imitations of Greek literature when Q is doing an imitation of Deuteronomy? So here you have a breakaway from the Hebraic scriptures and going into Greek literature. It's a great question to ask. So um dr mcdonald thank you for your time i really want to do more with you we could do more collabs we got to get your name out there I, I think you should be really be out there a lot more than you are and so i want to do my best to keep that endeavor happening and i hope you ladies and gentlemen will not only get the books because that helps him obviously he he wants his material to be known he's working with publishers trying to find a way to publicly um get, or if you will publish stuff for free He's not concerned about the income. He's more concerned about getting this material out while he's still alive. He's got boots on the ground. And of course, most of the, the information will probably get out when you're long gone. And I want this to try and get out while we're alive. So here I am, Myth Vision Podcast, trying to make that happen. 
Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you, Phil. And ladies and gentlemen, do not forget, we are Myth Vision. <laughs>